Welcome to the webinar with Professor Gerald Horn. So yes, we're live from Vienna. Uh, so this is the first lecture in a series of events deconstructing widespread notions of empire with a focus on the greatest imperialist power of our time, the United States of America. Um, so every generation is faced with an enemy of the people, uh, concretely the people of the global south, and it can be even the same enemy over generations. But as activists, we have to understand where we stand historically and how empire emerged, um, what constitutes empire and, and what shape it takes on now. So in the Genoub, we often say that the state has an institutional memory. It knows how to approach protest, uprising, and organize movements because it leans on its historical knowledge to refer back to past experiences and to improve its repression and counterinsurgency to eliminate or even prevent any threats to it and its state narrative from even emerging. Uh, we need to acquire this history to understand what we're navigating, what systems of oppression we're facing, where they stem from, and therefore where we position ourselves and how. Um, we are therefore absolutely honored to um, have you, Professor Gerald Horn, speak to us today on the topic of white supremacy as the foundation of the US and propaganda as a means to conceal it, stolen people and stolen land. So yes, um, just a humble introduction to Dr. Horn. Um, he holds the Moore's Professorship of African uh, of history and African American studies. His research has addressed issues of racism in a variety um, of relations involving labor, politics, civil rights, international relations, and war. He's also written extensively about the film industry. And uh, Dr. Horn's undergraduate courses include the civil rights movement and US history through film. He also teaches graduate courses in diplomatic history, labor history, and 20th century African American history. Dr. Horn is the author um, of more than 30 books and 100 scholarly articles and reviews. His current research includes two forthcoming books, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism and Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1918 to 1968, uh, and his other projects include a study of U.S. imperialism in Northeast Africa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and a similar study concerning U.S. imperialism in Southeast Asia during the same period. So very, um, a very wide field in terms of geography. Um, and uh, yeah, so to quote um, the Black Panther Party veteran and Black Liberation Army co-founder, Druba Muhad, who we have invited to Vienna three times, um, holding his last lecture last year, we're facing a so-called new age imperialism that can be allocated to the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the bilateral uh, world order at the time, which crystallized in the so-called uh, war on terror declared by George W. Bush following 9-11. And all in all, this monstrosity of US foreign policy, as well as the structural racism inside the country is clear to many, but people tend to blame isolated things, uh, symptoms of the problems, such as Donald Trump or the Jim Crow laws in the Southern states, or they have a disconnected understanding of historical events, um, such as the Vietnam or Iraq war, um, while often failing to address the issues at root of it all. So, yeah, uh, among the many books um, you wrote is The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America, which was published in 2014. In it, you deconstruct this US propaganda of the country being built on the fight for independence um, and among the issues you raise as fundamental components of the creation of the US is slavery. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on the on those foundational myths and explain why you call the revolts against British rule in North America or the so-called American Revolutionary War um, the counter-revolution? First of all, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate, appreciate it. Second of all, uh, just a slight clarification. Uh, those books that you mentioned on Texas and D.C. have been published, so mm -hmm. they're readily available. With regard to the question at hand, uh, 1776, the foundation of the United States of America, I'm afraid to say that many of our friends on the left, many who consider themselves to be revolutionaries, in fact, 
have really done a, a disservice in interpreting what happened in 1776 as a great leap forward for humanity. Uh, that is an utterly Eurocentric point of view. And in fact, uh, it's probably too charitable to call it Eurocentric. What I mean is, is that like uh, most uh, grand events, uh, 1776 involving the settlers revolt against London's rule was driven by two main factors. One was land, the other was labor or more specifically free labor, more specifically than that, the free labor of enslaved Africans. With regard to land, you may recall that in the run up to 1776, uh, there had been many conflicts between the settlers led by real estate speculator number one, George Washington, and his erstwhile colonial master in London. The real estate speculators wanted to continue moving west across the North Atlantic continent, excuse me, the North American continent, uh, seizing land from the indigenous population, waging war against the indigenous population, ultimately liquidating the indigenous population, and ultimately taking their land so that settlers from across Europe could be attracted uh, to this new homeland in North America. You may recall that from 1756 to 1763, London was involved in a death match for control of North America with its French antagonists across the channel. London prevailed in that war, although as you probably know, a lingering aspect of that victory is the fact that in the Canadian province of Quebec, which still exists, as you know, there is a French speaking majority. But as a result of that victory, London put its foot down and said, no more expenditure of blood and treasure to wage war against the indigenous population so that real estate speculators like George Washington uh, could triumph. Uh, this infuriated and enraged those like George Washington and was kindling for the ultimate, ultimate uh, combustible inflammation that led to 1776. The other aspect uh, of this revolt of course, was the desire for free enslaved African labor. Recall that in 1772, in Somerset's case, uh, London had fundamentally suggested that enslavement, at least in England, would no longer prevail. Given that it was the colonial master in North America, uh, that led to a reasonable suspicion that this decision would leapfrog the Atlantic and uh, thereby potentially jeopardize the fortunes of many of the so-called founding fathers of the United States, speaking of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, slave owners all. Jefferson, the third US president, uh, controlling uh, hundreds of enslaved Africans. But in order to get a better understanding of this question of enslaved African labor, it is useful to let your mind reel back to the so-called glorious revolution in England in the late 17th century. An, an essential aspect of this so-called glorious revolution as it has been termed was the fact that the merchant class felt that the monarch had too exclusive control over the lush profits of the traffic in slave Africans. The traffic in the slave Africans was one of the most lucrative enterprises known to humankind. Of course, you can invest $1 and get $1,700 back, and there are those today who would sell their firstborn for a 1,700% profit. And so what happens is that with the forced retreat of the monarch away from exclusive control of the traffic and the slave Africans, 
you had a horde of merchants descending upon the African continent with the maniacal energy of crazed bees, manacling and handcuffing every African in sight and dragging them across the Atlantic. The problem, of course, is that people do not want to be worked for free. They do not appreciate being dragged from their homelands thousands of miles to the West to toil on plantations, be they sugar plantations in Jamaica and Barbados or tobacco plantations in Virginia and Maryland. So this leads to slave revolts uh, at a number of points before the Haitian Revolution triumphs in 18 in 1804, uh, there, was, there were other attempts uh, by uh, enslaved Africans to seize control, which the Haitians ultimately did in 1804. Uh, this obviously had caught the attention of London and made them uh, more willing uh, to cut a deal uh, with the enslaved population and the black population more generally uh, than the settlers who were utterly dependent upon the enslaved population for their lush profits. And so this creates this fundamental contradiction between the settlers and London, which explodes, of course, in a bitter war between 1776 and 1783, of which the settlers win, not least because of assistance from France at the many of the pivotal battles of this conflict between the settlers in London, a significant percentage of those with arms in hand were actually French. Indeed, what happens is that the French go into debt in order to subsidize the settlers' revolts, the settlers' revolt, which then causes them to raise taxes in France itself, which leads to the French Revolution of 1789 and the overthrow of the monarch and also feeds in and fuels the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804. Now, I could continue in this vein, but perhaps it would be more fruitful if you would uh, direct me with your inquiries and questions so that I could speak more pointedly and directly to your concerns. Sorry, I didn't want the translation to um, disrupt the audio. Thank you so much for this um, historic outline. Um, that's a very important basis to start from. Um, perhaps, um, can you maybe tell us about how slavery continued to be central to all of this, slavery and land, and land possession, and um, you know what was really the essence of this settler society, how you already touched on the contradictions between the settlers and uh, the crown or mainland Europe. Um, so what exactly, um, how would you characterize those and their maybe economic um, dreams in on stolen land, stolen people on stolen land? Well, perhaps uh, let us begin by having our minds reeled back to 1492 when, as you know, the freebooter Christopher Columbus uh, crosses the Atlantic and basically plunders the indigenous populations that he encounters. 1492 was also a pivotal year because it marks a turning point in terms of what has been characterized as Muslim or Arab control of Spain. Uh, that was lurching to a conclusion in 1492. Likewise, in 1492, you see the Spanish Catholics begin to expel the Jewish population from the Iberian Peninsula, from Spain. So what's happening is that Spain, which considers itself to be a significant power even then, was definitely afraid of a comeback by the Muslims and retaking control of Spain. And this helps to undergird their exploitation and plunder of the wealth of indigenous populations, not only in the Caribbean, but ultimately in Mexico and Cuba, in Peru, 
their comrades in Portugal uh, seize control of Brazil, et cetera. But this is taking place also post-1517 in the context of religious conflict, not least within the Catholic Church itself, because it's in 1517 that Martin Luther of what is now Germany secedes from the Catholic Church on grounds of corruption. Uh, his Protestant secession uh, finds willing ears in London. And a few decades later, uh, King Henry VIII adopts uh, Protestantism. And of course, you still have a state religion uh, in London as we speak. But this helps to ignite a series of religious wars and conflicts between Protestants and Catholics. The problem for the Protestants is number one, they want a share of the bounty that France has been able to accumulate, excuse me, that Spain has been able to accumulate uh, by looting and plundering Cuba and the Caribbean and Mexico, et cetera. But the problem for the Protestants was the problem of numbers. Uh, that is to say, at this particular moment, uh, the Protestant sect was a minority, to put it mildly, on the European continent. And this leads to the construction of whiteness, this new identity politics. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that London, which had expelled its Jewish population at the end of the 13th century, was forced to come to an accommodation with the Jewish population because they needed numbers. They needed warm bodies if they were to get in on the colonial feast. And so you see the construction of this identity of whiteness, those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, uh, English versus Irish, English versus Scots, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Ukrainian, Pole versus Russian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian. The list is endless. Um, all of a sudden, when they cross the Atlantic, they become white, <laughs> this new identity. And it's interesting, in the United States today, uh, you have millions of people who are defined as white, and they have no clue about how this identity was constructed. In fact, this identity has been quite elastic because you may know that the identity is tinged with religion. What I mean by that is if a Lebanese Christian migrates to North America and presumably they're melanin deficient and have a US accent, speak English with the US accent, they can be integrated into the uh, so-called white population. The same for Palestinians, for example. As a matter of fact, in an episode that continues to bother me, I was speaking at a panel in Texas just a few years ago. And I was trying to extend solidarity to the Palestinian population by saying that you are suffering under settler colonialism in historic Palestine. We are suffering under settler colonialism in North America. The Palestinian, he objected. <laughs> he was defending the United States. He wanted me to, to castigate settler colonialism in Palestine, but he wanted nothing to do with this idea of settler colonialism in North America. And not only that, he was backed up by other Palestinians who were there. Because I get, you know, Palestinians who are Christians in particular, when they migrate across the Atlantic, they're viewed as white. That means that they can enjoy certain privileges. Now, they don't want to deal with that, obviously. But in any case, to get back to my major thread, so you have the construction of this uh, politics of identity known as whiteness, uh, which then allows for uh, London to scoop up a number of territories in North America that were thought to belong to the Spanish, for example, Spain had sent settlers to what is now Florida as early as 1565. Actually, Spain had sent settlers to the area north of Florida uh, 
as early as the 1520s. But what happens to that earlier uh, venture is that the Africans who they brought with them revolted against the Spanish, and that is a, a crucial uh, factor in, in, indeed in shaping settler colonialism and defected to the Native American side and liquidated all the Spanish settlers. But the second settlement in 1565 was more successful from the Spanish point of view. In fact, Florida, which is now the third most populous state in the United States of America, behind California and Texas, interestingly enough, you may know that all three of those states, California, Texas, and Florida, were once under Spanish rule before the Sp Spanish were ousted. Florida had, has been under or had been under a Spanish control from about 1565 till 1820 when the United States takes over. So you've had Spanish rule in Florida longer than you've had US rule in Florida, which of course exists to this very day. And so what happens is that this idea of whiteness becomes the winning ticket because what happens is that whiteness, it involves class collaboration. If you look at the first settlements in North America, you have Europeans of various class backgrounds sponsored by the elite in London, but all bent and determined on seizing land from the Native Americans. And with a little bit of luck and a lot of pluck, uh, they can wind up controlling the free labor of enslaved Africans. So part of the issue in the United States today, which even people on the left do not want to acknowledge, even people who consider themselves revolutionary do not want to acknowledge, is that there is a very strong tendency towards class collaboration amongst the Euro-American working class in particular. And that helps to explain this Donald Trump phenomenon, whereby a man who is facing four indictments, 91 criminal charges, a civil trial beginning in a few days that may lead to a severe wounding of his commercial empire, this man received 74, 75 million votes in 2020. He is the leading contender for the presidency to replace Joe Biden in November 2024. A recent Washington Post poll suggested that as we speak, he is 10 points ahead of Joe Biden. So he may be returning to the White House as early as January 2025, uh, which of course could lead to severe pain inflicted upon many communities, my, my community not least, because of course the black population of votes against the right wing at a higher percentage than any other demographic. At sometimes at a rate of nine to one, for example, or, or eight to two. And despite uh, considerable publicity to a number of black people who have decided that the better part of wisdom is to throw in their lot with the right wing as a way to save their skins, Black people continue to vote at a very heavy rate against the right wing. But once again, part of the problem in the United States is that even for those who consider themselves to be radical or revolutionary or socialist or even communist, they really don't understand the battlefield on which they're struggling. They really do not understand the United States of America. They do not understand how class collaboration is inherent to settler colonialism. And as a result, uh, there are few rational or adequate explanations that would shed light on the multiple difficulties that the world would face if Mr. Trump comes come back to office. Now, uh, let me say that if he does come back to office, I think that one of the things you probably will see is that he'll try to cut a deal with regard to Russia and Ukraine, because obviously this Ukraine escapade is not going very well. Uh, 
even many in Congress are beginning to suspect that. And so the idea is to cut a deal with Russia and then focus like a laser beam on China. Because the US ruling class sees China as the major threat to US imperial hegemony. But a segment of the US ruling class sees Ukraine as a distraction, as a diversion from what should be the main focus, which is the People's Republic of China. So once again, I'll stop here and allow you to intervene. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we kind of got the recipe for building a successful settler society. You have um, people with a lot of contradictions coming from different social classes, different uh, religious backgrounds, uh, being part of religious minorities, be it uh, Protestant, Jewish, uh, atheists as well, um, and of course Catholics coming together. Um, some of them maybe not even considered white at the time, if we're talking about the Irish, for example, um, some rebels like the 1848 revolutionaries in Germany, some of them being um, apparently abolitionists as well, they all come together and they are united by um, economic and political interests. Um, they are all promised free labor of enslaved Africans, as you said, uh, the land of massacred Native Americans, um, economic opportunities that they would not have had in that form uh, in Europe. Um, and, and of course, the chance to be part of, I don't know how to put this any differently, but the superior race um, or to turn into it um, with the example we said with the peoples not necessarily considered white um, or even being colonized. Um, and yeah, I can see this also in other scenarios with other settler colonies like um, in occupied Palestine and, and this common identity that is created, even though it has a lot of holes in it and a lot of contradictions at the moment with a lot of political chaos inside um, the settler government, um, but it's people from across all of Europe and also outside of Europe coming together to be part of um, what is the ethno state or, or the society of like the good part of, you know, the superior part of uh, the ethno state of Israel and being united by, you know, not being Palestinians and profiting from the land and labor of Palestinians. So <clears throat> yeah, did I understand that correctly? You, you certainly did. And, and let me just reflect upon a couple of the points that you made. What, what's remarkable about these settler projects is that as you suggested, uh, those who consider themselves to be revolutionary in Europe, uh, those uh, fleeing Europe as a result of the counter revolutions of 1848, uh, once arriving on these shores, speaking of North America, I think to be fair and honest, many of them do not necessarily align with the right, but many of them really don't question <laughs> the basic structure of the society in which they find themselves. The idea of taking land from the Native Americans is normalized. It, it, it's seen as inevitable, for example, and it's seen as some might say, advancing the productive forces. Some of them, of course, uh, do object to slavery. I think that's fair to say. But if you don't grapple with the indigenous question in North America, you're basically missing the boat. Uh, you are not uh, in tune with what's going on. And this also reminds me that with regard to the Paris Commune, 1870, 1871, uh, which was a, shall we say, premature attempt uh, by the exploited and the oppressed to take control of society. What happens, of course, is that they're defeated. And many of the communards, as they're called, are then deported across the planet to what is now this French colony of New Caledonia which is in the South Seas, not far distant from Australia. And what's interesting is that if you look at the history of New Caledonia, 
uh, which by the way, is a nation that has rich mineral resources, particularly nickel, uh, which is important for the green economy. It's remarkable and striking how so many of the communards and certainly their descendants were able to accommodate themselves to the settler project in New Caledonia, accommodate themselves to the uh, colonialism of New Caledonia uh, to the point now where many of them are blocking a New Caledonia independence uh, over the indigenous population's wishes. You might know that uh, French mom, excuse me, uh, Mr. Macron, President Macron has visited uh, New Caledonia because he's worried uh, about uh, keeping the lid on that colony since obviously the lid is being blown off French neo-colonies in Niger and Burkina Faso and Mali and Guinea Conakry. And I should also mention another point. Uh, I'm happy to see that you're trying to draw parallels between the settler project in historic Palestine and the settler project in North America. Because as, as I said a moment or two ago, when I tried to draw that parallel, speaking to an audience of Palestinians here in, in Texas, I thought they were gonna lynch me. You know, they, they got very upset. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I still find that incredible. But it's also interesting as well, because many people in the United States, including people on the left, they're very proud and boastful about 1776, which they see as this great leap forward for humanity. But yet, as the social scientists might say, you have a control group across the border in Canada. Now, when I draw this analogy between Canada and the United States, I'm accused of uh, being an apologist for Canadian imperialism. But that's not true, obviously. It's a concept of relativity. What I mean is, is that if the revolution, so-called, in North America in 1776 was so great, well, why is it that Canada has a healthcare system which one would see as an emblem of modernity and of civilization? Why does Canada have a healthcare system that's far in advance of the pay or die healthcare system of the United States of America? Or to use another example, uh, some years ago, I wrote a book about the uh, uh, British colony in Southern Africa, then known as Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, the Northern neighbor of South Africa. And when the British settlers in 1965 chose to revolt against London's rule because they felt that London was moving towards one person, one vote, meaning African majority rule, the settlers revolted, just as the settlers revolted in 1776 when they thought that London was moving to circumscribe the ability of the settlers to continue seizing Native American land, or perhaps just as important, uh, circumscribing the ability to enslave Africans. And so Ian Smith, who was the leader of this racist regime, he argued in 1965 that he was walking in the footsteps of 1776. And there was something to what he said. Uh, in fact, if you look at my book that was published a few years ago on this Rhodesia Zimbabwe conflict, you will find that uh, a number of the settlers in Rhodesia had relatives in the United States of America. That includes the former US president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. That includes the spouse of war criminal, Henry Kissinger, now past 100 years of age. And indeed, when Rhodesia decided to fight to maintain racist rule, you had hundreds, perhaps thousands of mercenaries from the United States who flocked to that part of Africa to fight against African majority rule. And in fact, many of them are now buried in Africa. And indeed, if you look 
at some of the more recent racist massacres that have taken place in the United States of America. For example, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, just uh, weeks ago, the racist assailant had the insignia of Rhodesia. He was, saw himself as acting in solidarity with Rhodesia. You may recall that during the Obama years, parishioners in a Christian church in Charleston, South Carolina, were massacred by a racist assailant. He too carried the insignia of Rhodesia. So what I'm trying to suggest to you and your audience is that there's a kind of racist international. Perhaps you could call it a settler international. Perhaps you could call it a settler colonial international that goes across borders, that is not confined to one particular nation state. And ultimately they look to US imperialism for salvation. However, I have news for those in Europe in particular who have been relying upon US imperialism to be the ultimate guarantor of world imperialism. US imperialism is in a crisis today that may be terminal. That is to say that the contradictions between the classes, particularly the working class and the capitalist class are becoming ever sharper. The racist contradictions are becoming ever sharper. It's not clear to me at least if US imperialism will be able to continue to play its role as the guarantor of world imperialism. And I think that that realization has dawned in your next door neighbor, speaking of Germany, uh, which threw in its lot with regard to this Ukrainian escapade, suffered a bombing of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, pumping natural gas from Russia into Germany, cheap energy from Russia, and a relationship with China helped to explain the so-called German miracle of German economic growth. But now Germany is en route to becoming the sick man of Europe that will have knock-on effects in Austria, in Vienna as well. And Germany is forced to contemplate whether or not, just as it has been obligated and compelled to disrupt relations with Russia at the behest of US imperialism, now it's being asked to disrupt relations with China at the behest of US imperialism. That contradiction is too sharp. Uh, it's not sustainable. However, it bodes well for peace and progress. Thank you. That's a really interesting analysis and prediction. Um, so um, there's a lot that you told us, and it's essential to US imperialism, to US history. And why do people not know about this? Um, you have talked before about the so-called grievous proliferation of propagandistic historiography in the US. And I think it's important for all of us, even for us in Europe, to broadly understand how this propagandistic historiography broadly works, because it seems to be quite efficient across the globe, um, with different settler colonies hardly being questioned as such as countries built on stolen land, or Western international organizations and institutions such as NATO, the EU, the IMF, the World Bank, um, with them um, reinforcing colonial or new colonial policies and power dynamics um, as if it's just how the world was always meant to be. So could you elaborate on that a bit? Well, first of all, there is a structural issue. I'm afraid to say that uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the United States about a so-called labor aristocracy. Uh, that is to say a segment of the US working class uh, that uh, has thrown in its lot with the US ruling class. Uh, you might recall, if you look at the history of the US labor movement, uh, for the longest time, uh, you had skilled workers, carpenters, electricians, etc., who were not interested in organizing 
an organized non-skilled workers. That began to change in the 1930s as a result of initiatives by the US Communist Party in particular, but that particular mindset still holds. What I'm suggesting is that if you go back to the origins of settler colonialism, which I have done in the past 45 minutes, you will easily see that uh, there were many Europeans who felt that they benefited from settler colonialism. Uh, they tended to uh, normalize the idea of taking land from the Native Americans uh, from their point of view, uh, might makes right. Although interestingly, if you press them, they would not necessarily sign on to that idea, that cynical opportunistic idea that might makes right. But objectively, that's what they were co-signing. And so as a result from the inception of the United States of America post 1776, uh, there was this idea that this was this grand Republican small r experiment, a grand democratic experiment embodied in the US Constitution. However, if you look at the US Constitution, it's, it was mostly a paper document. What, what I mean is uh, I'm giving a lecture in a few days on book banning. Um, you have an epidemic of banning of books in this country. In fact, a right-wing pol politician in Missouri got a flamethrower and shot flames at a pile of books <laughs> to, to, to destroy these books. And what I'm going to point out in this lecture is that book burning is nothing new. If you want to understand why certain points of view become popularized and other points of view do not look to book burning and look to the mass support that certain book bannings receive. And once again, look to the US Constitution, which on paper guarantees freedom of speech and freedom of thought. But as any second year law student could tell you, the US Constitution had limited applicability nationally until after the US Civil War. Supposedly, it was designed to apply in the federal district in Washington, DC. But even in Washington, DC, th there was no freedom of speech or freedom of thought. Ask the enslaved population in Washington, DC. They had no right to protest against slavery uh, before 1865, before 1861, I should say. Uh, they had no right with regard to having their slave cabins not be invaded, despite the fact that the US Constitution says that you should be safe in your possessions at home, for example. And so in order to understand this sad state of affairs in the United States, you not only have to understand book bannings, book burnings, and I think it was one of your neighbors, Heinrich Heine, I think his name was, who said that people, they start off by burning books, and then they move to burning people. And that has been the historical trajectory in the United States of America. Uh, that is to say, lynchings, uh, which afflicted my ancestors uh, for decades, oftentimes were very ritualistic, involving burning at the stake of Black men in particular, uh, who had violated the social and economic codes of society. So number one, in order to understand the triumph of propaganda and negative propaganda at that in the United States, you have to understand the mass support for settler colonialism in certain circles. You have to understand that growing out of that mass support has been an attempt to suppress dissenting ideas uh, up to and including uh, banning books, uh, burning books. And this particular ethos continues to this very day, uh, this idea that certain notions are considered to be uh, forbidden. Now, perhaps some of you are wondering, uh, okay, Professor Horn, 
we hear what you're saying, but here you are, you're sitting in Texas <laughs> telling us all this. Uh, why are you allowed to do this? Well, that's a good question. And I'm not sure if I will be allowed <laughs> to do this <laughs> for much longer. Uh, but fortunately, uh, I'm able to do so now. And so I will do so until the last breath escapes from my body. Okay, so um, given this extensive of the United States, um, the Center of Western Peerless came about and with the goals of the country. Can you hear me or hear me better? Or Yeah, I hear you better. Continue. Sorry. Um, exactly. So, so given the historical analysis, um, I would like for us to come full circle and get back to our generation that we mentioned in the beginning. Um, so we need to draw parallels from this historical recount as we have already uh, done a bit. Uh, we need to draw parallels to current political structures at heart of the many issues that we see addressed today without an analysis of their political foundations. Um, what major fronts can you identify today and what are the major obstacles and opportunities for activists um, whether they're facing this imperialist power or whether they're also deceived by its propaganda and therefore fi fighting on false fronts. Um, so what do you what do you see? Well, I think there's reason for optimism. Um, there's reason for optimism in terms of some of the, the trends in the international community. Uh, for example, the rise of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, with the candidates member, members being Egypt, Ethiopia, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Argentina, that, that's an alternative to North Atlantic hegemony that's growing before our very eyes. And you see concomitantly the weakening of institutions where there has been US imperial hegemony. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid to say that it's included the United Nations. You might have noted at the UN General Assembly in New York just a few days ago that not only did President Xi of China not attend, President Putin did not attend, but also Rishi Sunak in London and President Macron in Paris did not attend. And speaking of, of Macron, uh, he has a very difficult brief to argue because you may recall that he sees what time it is. And so he made an application to join the BRICS. <laughs> of course, it was turned down as well it should have been. But I, th I think that that bespeaks the kind of desperation uh, that you see uh, in ruling circles. Obviously, there is conflict, inter-imperialist conflict between France and the United States uh, over uh, France's neo empire in Africa. The United States would like to elbow uh, France aside and take control of that empire. And some of the signs are not encouraging in that regard. What I mean is that if you look at Niger, for example, uh, the United States, which has been quite lethargic in appointing ambassadors, in the midst of the crisis in Niger, ignited in late July 2023, the United States parachuted an ambassador uh, into Niamey at the same time that the French ambassador was in the process of being ousted. Uh, there have been raucous demonstrations at the French base in Niger, not so much at the US base in Niger. And then what really galled France was how US imperialism elbowed France aside and scooped up a multi-billion dollar submarine contract with Australia which was quite uh, concerning to France. And so you see these conflicts erupting between and amongst the imperialist powers. I see that and I interpret that as a sign of what they perceive 
as a growing debility, as a growing weakness of the imperialist bloc. So in order, one of the lessons we learned uh, from the study of black history in the United States is that oftentimes progress for black people in the United States, given the rather depressing correlation of forces we face domestically, has been dependent upon the international situation. Uh, that is to say, you saw the US apartheid Jim Crow began to retreat in the 1950s as African and Caribbean nations were coming to independence. Washington found it difficult to appeal to these nations as long as US apartheid obtained. That created a dynamic that led to the erosion of Jim Crow. With regard to slavery, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, ignited a general crisis of the slave system that ultimately led to that system's collapse, including in North America. And so many of us in the Black liberation movement in the United States pay careful and close attention to the international situation. And we use that in order to plot strategy. That helps to determine whether or not we should advance or should we retreat. And right now, I would say it's time for advance because imperialism is on the back foot. Uh, they're suffering a monumental defeat in Ukraine. They're being forced to rethink sanctions on Venezuela. U.S. imperialism has a totally dysfunctional relationship with China. On the one hand, it would like to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. On the other hand, it's reliant upon loans from the People's Bank in Beijing in order for the U.S. government to stay afloat. That's ultimately an unsustainable relationship and it does not speak well for the future prospects of US imperialism. So let me conclude on that upbeat note. And that is to say, after spending an hour talking about slavery and genocide, and lynching, and mass murder and class collaboration and opportunism, et cetera, let us conclude on an upbeat note of advance, of advance forward. Thank you so, so much, Professor Gerald Horn. So thank you for this, for this clear analysis again and, and the historical recount that we have to always keep in mind um, and also the outlook for the future that is giving us um, a bit of hope, which I think we need to build on as activists and also this reminder of the centrality of um, global politics. Um, to our work and to the power dynamics that we try to counter. So, yeah, I cannot thank you enough. And uh, we have this big audience in Vienna um, listening eagerly, and and uh, we're going to open a discussion um, internally in Dalton Loop um, based on the foundation that you gave us now. And um, yeah, I can only thank you for your time and, and for this great talk. How many people are at the Al Danube headquarters? Um, okay, one, fifteen. Fifteen. I see more, but fifteen, which is, you know, in Austria, it's a very Zionist uh, country, and there's, so it's a good number, and we also have live translation to Arabic, so um, that more people understand uh, your talk and are included in the discussion after. So. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, then have a nice day and hope to hear from you soon. Ditto. Good luck. Bye-bye.